I popped over before Christmas to do an exchange of gifts and I saved up the gift that you'd got me uh, until Boxing Day. But I was glad I'd saved it because alongside a couple of lovely books, <sighs> I got this <laughs> marvellous, marvellous tool. I think it's such a useful thing for yeah. planting at the base. Uh, say things like climbing roses. You're quite right. I mistakenly planted it on my fence. So obviously you then just have the top and the, yeah. the bottom bit. If, you, if it isn't growing through anything, it's quite ugly. Well, it didn't. No, it's not ugly. It just doesn't look very nice. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going with ugly. <laughs> Welcome to episode 72 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston, old vicarage, all bundled up in his uh, polo neck and gilet, no less, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And down there in Cambridgeshire, looking smiley, Lordus <laughs> Maria Sophia Fredrickson. Well, actually, we're straddling East Anglia. We represent the many corners of East Anglia on the podcast today because joining us for his first ever appearance on Talking Dirty, we have the garden designer Tom Hoblin in Suffolk. Uh, before we get stuck into planty stuff, Tom, do you have any middle names to bring to the party? Uh, Charles Forrester. Oh, <laughs> I'm frightfully smart. Oh, they're some of the <laughs> finest ones we've ever had. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> forest is quite appropriate, though. <laughs> Where did the forest come from? Uh, my mother's maiden names, though, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> that is great. Well, before we got kind of recording properly, we were discussing the whole Tom, Thomas Hoblin thing. I mean, you should have just gone for the full name if you wanted to sound Sorry. very grandiose yeah. <laughs> with your garden design <laughs> business. Pack them all in there. Um, we actually saw you in person, a rare treat That's over the past couple of years, uh, at the Chelsea Flower Show, where you had a delightful garden. Yeah, no, you did. I, I, I vaguely remember, it was such a blur, but I do remember <laughs> meeting you both, which is great. I mean, Alan, I have met Alan before, but go and pester him in his garden and ask him questions. But yeah, <laughs> And it was the Boodle Secret Garden, which mesmerised yeah. us because it had so many interesting plants in it, didn't it, Alan? Yes, it did. It had um, a delightful little pink flower, a butylon. You're right. It was called Pink Charm. It's a great plant, a butylon. That's right. I remember that now. There are a race of a butylons, aren't there? That are sort of midway between the large flowered hybrids and Megapotanicum, which is the small flowered one with these sort of locket heart shaped flowers. Um, yeah. They've been bred during recent years, and I think Pink Charm was one of those. And I think it's a much better garden plant from the point of view that it, it's shorter jointed, um, it doesn't have such large, glabrous, vine-like leaves as the large flowered hybrids, and I think it produces more flowers. It is very, it is very floriferous. I mean, I, I was just, I was literally trying to find them what was pink, because that was part of the brief from Boodles, that they had to have yep. pink flowers. And that's the one I came up with. And I can't, I think I got it from Hedgehog Plants, you know, in very, very near Berries and Tedmans. Yes, you're yeah. right. The other ones are quite gaudy colours. They're quite often yeah. quite loud. I mean, I like loud colours, but this, this, I chose this one. And it's a more sort of species like one as well, which I, I exactly, like. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I got a couple of those from Shrublands Nursery, which is down your way as well. Shrublands, um, yeah. Must go there. <laughs> yeah. They, they had a rather delightful small flowered orange one and uh, a lemon one as well. Uh, yes, there is a beautiful lemon one, a yep. beautiful, I uh, can't remember the name of that. Is it Lemon Drop or something like that? What struck me when we chatted to you at Chelsea is that you really love your plants. There are some garden designers who that the plants seem to be a bit more incidental, but for you, it's uh, it's the real focus. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I suppose that's my background, really, having, you know, because I, I went to Kew or trained at Kew and things. I mean, I obviously, it, it's, I mean, really garden design. I design places to put plants and that I think it's about more plants I can get in the better. So, so that's, yeah, that's what I'm all about. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is entirely refreshing because I have to say it's, it's, it's refreshing to meet and talk with a garden designer who knows plants. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no comment. No, um, <laughs> but it's, it, but you know what though, Alan, from a, from a, from a business point of view, that's my sort of niche is it, quite often my clients are keen gardeners and know their plants and, and want to work with someone who knows their plants. And, yeah. and, and, and I'm, I actually trained in an agricultural background originally. Uh, I did my degree in agriculture first. And so I've got a very good understanding of soil and climate and things. So I, I'm, you know, for example, I get always get a very thorough soil analysis uh, of a client's garden, um, 
you know, for not just pH, but also trace elements and everything. So I can, I can safely put together an interesting palette that they probably haven't seen before oh, that will work that will work in the in, in in their garden so yeah i love all these illusions um we haven't obviously started at the very beginning of your gardening life and career but it's uh, it's sort of there's a bit of Q in there there's a bit of agriculture in there and <laughs> yeah, soil yeah. science and things so yeah. were you always into nature gardening kind of what came first what age did this all start for you uh, well, I, I, I guess it's sort of uh, uh, just the next generation. <laughs> so uh, my, my grandfather, he was a fruit. Uh, uh, he worked at East Morling Research Station in fruit all his life. Uh, he, he, his big claim to fame is he, he developed the dwarfing rootstocks that we still use today uh, and was given an OBE yeah. for it. So he was a Tom Hoblin as well. And my cousin's a nurseryman and, you know, it's just, a, it's an old family. So, and, and I'm really pleased to say my son, my eldest son has just, uh, he's uh, graduated from Rittle and his degree in horticulture and he's gone into horticulture as well. So it, it carries on. <laughs> <laughs> it's properly in the genes. So yeah. are you one of the guests? We love to hear the sort of memories of gardening as a child. We've heard them from Alan. Uh, did, were you that child who had a little corner of garden and was growing things? Yeah, yeah. We had a little, uh, given a vegetable garden plot, whereas my brother and sister were, were always keen on trying to get the biggest sunflower. I was always, I, I, I don't know, and, and, and I know, I'm sure it goes without saying you're the same, but, you know, you, I still get just as excited when I can get something interesting to germinate that, you know, from seed as back then, you know. So it was carrots then, and, and then literally I collected some... Um, uh, Juniperus phoenicia from Spain last week or the week before, and and, and I'm now going to try and germinate that. So it's 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 like it's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one hundred percent. I just had a couple of um, seed moments this morning. The first is that I went to a compare a, a, a garden event in Ipswich, and yeah. a, a man I know there called David Star Starling from. Essex, he said to me, oh, you remember, did you, do you remember giving me Cobia scandens? And I said, yes. He said, I've got masses of fruit. Would you like some? Oh, and so he sent me some and they're right in this soggy little envelope and all the rest of it. But the first, the first germinated. If it's seed is, is, is very, uh, yesterday I was at a nurse, a uh, place called Forest Art, um, which is in Shrewsbury, um, that um, collects native tree seed from all around the UK and also Europe and they they and they've got all the equipment to be able to sort of scarify it and and you know make it go through um uh what's it called uh, dormancy you know break dormancy and clean it up and sell it again and literally they had these huge bins big one ton one cubic meter bins full of like beech seed and everything and so and I've never seen it was just an amazing place to go I do recommend it if you're over that way so, that's yeah. interesting wow yeah. <laughs> well they're, 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 they should be very very busy with this plant a tree thing going on and everybody sort of I think is getting enthusiastic about that yeah and, and that's I mean part of my read is my son is starting off a tree growing nursery to grow native trees um you know just little cell grown trees yeah. with all these grants you know Boris Johnson wants us to plant seven million trees or something in the next three years which is impossible um but <laughs> my son's hoping to make a dent in that number by and so he we're just building a polytunnel for him now to to, to be able to do that so yeah good luck <laughs> so that's why i was there so alan did you have uh, some cobia scandens turn up uh seed turn up in a little envelope at your house then yes i did and it's, it's suddenly you know there's about three days after seeing david this little soggy envelope turned up i also am growing a uh, heavy astrum from seed which is one that you can't buy anywhere and it's oh. called Vitatum, I think. And what it actually does, it, it's, it's not as quite as big as those huge monstrosities that look so self-conscious in a pot, don't they? Top heavy and all that. Um, but this one makes a bulb, a central bulb, and then, you know, there's chickens all the way around it. So it's got babies all the way around oh, it. Really? And it clumps Ooh. and clumps and clumps. And it is said to double in size every year. In other words, the clump gets more and more and more. So that you get a pot absolutely full of it. And I, they said on the, it came from Plant World Seeds and they said 12 seeds in the packet. I've got 30 germinated and I'm so pleased. <laughs> yeah. So Two did years. you, was it yeah. a tricky, was it a tricky to germinate or did you did literally just sow it and leave it? Or? I sowed it and I 
covered it with um you know that stuff that lets the light through what's it called vermiculite, vermiculite? yeah yeah vermiculite covered it with vermiculite and then i watered it and put it on a warm bench and uh, and three weeks later first seeds are popping up um but how will you um germinate the kabaya to think i'm well i've got them on the warm bench again yeah I planted two seeds in each little pot and filled the, pot, the seed tray with the pots and again with vermiculite on the top first one has germinated and is that quite a big seed? They're they're very flat. The seeds are very flat. And when you sow them, you sow them on edge. Oh, I see. So you put them down like that, that way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they. I mean, they're very easy to germinate. But the problem with growing cobayas from seed is the fact that quite often they take a very long time to kick into uh, to, into flower. So you need to, I mean, ideally, you need to sow them in 2021 to bloom in 2022. Yeah. Which is why I've got them germinating now, you see. Yeah. yeah. This is why I buy them, I buy blood plants, because I just... <laughs> I, 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 I just I just love the idea of growing things from seed, though. I just think it's yeah. just um, the most fantastic experience, really. There's the thing, lots of people say, you know, or I couldn't b b uh, grow bulbs from seed because you have to wait too long. Well, yes, you do have to wait a certain length of time. Um, and I'm going to wait two years at least for the first of my hippiastrum seeds. But that doesn't matter to me. It'd be because, more rewarding. Yeah, exactly. But mm. if you sow some seeds every year, and if they're yeah. bulbs such as narcissi or tulips, and I've done tulip plus brangrii like that as well. You know, if you sow, sow some every year, every year that goes past, there's a new one in flower, if you see what I mean. Yeah, no, I'm completely with you on that one. Though I'm very jealous of your warm bench because obviously I have basically no facilities. So um, I think at some point in the autumn I sowed um, Lichnis carnea. I had some seed heads, so I sowed oh, it. Oh, yes. Yeah, they yeah. came up like mustard and cress. So now yeah. I'm just watching them, expecting some cold snaps probably going to do them in. I don't know how hardy they are. I've never grown them before. So I do find it a bit stressful growing things from seed when you yeah. haven't got somewhere to <laughs> look after them and protect them. Yeah, but I still tend to kill things off even if I've got the right things. But uh, <laughs> we've got a greenhouse, we've got a heated bench as well but I, I still get it wrong every so often so yeah so be careful because one of the things about a warm bench is that it can get too warm and it can and dry the roots out so that if you're watering um plants you may possibly think that the whole the whole cell is full of water and it's not it's good because, and that can be um how harmful to them so what i often do is i put a, a shallow tray on my warm bench and then put the plants on that so because that dilutes the warmth Oh, just like to diffuse, yeah, so, so it's just yeah. off the heat. Like a diffuser. Bit. That's a good idea, yeah. But yeah, you, you clearly have um, some facilities, Tom, and we've, you know, talked uh, off air about your, your lovely spot in Suffolk. You've got a nice area to play with. Yeah, no, it's, um, so I'm on, I've got two and a half acres here and I back onto wetland. Actually, when I went and took the dogs for a walk this morning, I thought, gosh, another couple of rains and we'll be underwater so like half my garden from now on is underwater for the for the uh, for the winter really and uh, which is re it's really beautiful actually uh, when it does happen and it seems to be happening more and more every year but the the weird the odd thing as you we all know is we're in the driest part of the UK yet I'm underwater yeah. for <laughs> half half the year sort of thing so but my climax vegetation I suppose around me my, is, is alder and crack willow yeah, um, that that's my tree, my landscape, my horizon. I see from here, so it, it's it's very very pretty, uh, and and I really like it. But uh, it, you know, it has other problems obviously as well. But yeah, but and then the, I've got a kitchen garden just behind me, um, a wall garden which has got a crinkle crankle wall. Um, oh, lovely! When we looked at the house, was it twenty years ago? I think it was. I looked no further than that wall. As soon as I rose at the crinkle crankle wall, I said, we're going to buy this house. <laughs> I'd have done exactly so, the same. <laughs> so, uh, um, and, and what I've done is I've trained, I've got nectarines and peaches in, in the sort of crinkle or the crankle, um, and, um, on, and which is the south facing wall. Uh, and then I put cordon, pear and apple on the uh, west facing wall. Uh, and then I've done a spallier pears on a pergola that runs up the centre. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what, what your, your views on fruit are. But I, of course, when I first did this and I've got a small orchard down in the garden, is I, I all went, of course, you go for all the lovely old fashioned cultivars of apple. And 
you read, I remember reading, is it Cobb's book, uh, William Cobbett or whatever, you know, Darcy spices, the best tasting apple ever. And, and so I planted them all. And I don't really, I, I don't, they're, far, they're interesting, but they're not great. And my theory is, is because we were raised eating Cox's orange pippin, unless Cox's orange pippin is in the parentage of the apple, we won't like it. I don't know if you, I don't know what you think about that, but you know, if you think like Laxton's Superb, Laxton's Fortunes, all those, they've always got Cox's Orange Pippin in the Parentage or Worcester Pear Main, all those, and they're delicious. But the ones beyond Cox's, I think, are rather disappointing. <laughs> I, I, yes, I think I probably agree. Um, but I mean, it's it's interesting nonetheless. We've got an orchard here of I wanted to plant it of old Norfolk apple trees. But there weren't oh. sufficient varieties, so I did, went for old East Anglian apple, apples. Um, and goodness knows what they all are. But, I mean, they, they vary in size from sort of tiny little bright red things to whopping great golden things. Um, um, you've got, um, you must have L M Nathurley, which is a one from your area. And then there's yes, Norfolk yes. Beefing, isn't there? There's a Norfolk yes, there Beefing, which is a yes. big red one. And, and right. even the flesh is a little bit... That's quite a nice tasting apple, actually. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I, 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 we've got a community orchard, which of course I, I engineered in the village, and I've made them plant those that were those ones there. So yeah. <laughs> I actually stole a couple of apples from your orchard when I came up for the last plant there, Alan. And um, the rest of the people that were there that day. <laughs> They're very nice. It's quite, it's quite sharp, but it was nice and refreshing at the end of the day. I was quite hungry. I thought, I'm sure Alan won't mind me stealing an apple. <laughs> but that M. Nathurley is a really good one, actually. I, I, I know where the original fruit tree is for that as well. It's in M. M. Nath. It's still there and still alive. Emneth, one of the most satisfying places to say, tiny little place, sort of up on the border uh, of yeah. Norfolk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So your garden, a couple of acres, and I think you look after some neighbouring acres as well. So a bit of a gorilla gardener in a way. Um, my neighbour has got five acres on the other side, which is mostly nettle, bramble, uh, crack willow and alder. Very nice, uh, but I, every time I grow trees from seed and I've run out of space here, I do tend to plant them on his and I mow a network of paths to walk through and, and, and it's pretty wild. Um, and then on the other side, I've got a wetland meadow. It's about five and a half acres that the farmer doesn't do anything with. So I, I cut it for hay every July. And um, since we've been cutting it for 18 years now, um, we, we, we've got um, early purple orchid, yeah. pyramidalis and I used to have sheep, I don't anymore, but when they sometimes when the soil gets poached a bit, I'll, I'll sometimes get a bee orchid if I'm lucky as well. Yeah, that's Amazing. really nice. I'm really happy with it. It's a magical so, setting. And uh, I know you brought some show and tell to uh, yes, shout yes. about some of the, the things you've got in your garden. Obviously, like you say, a, a, a challenging spot with the flooding that you have to deal with. Yeah, it, it is. Yes, I got a sort of like fen like peat, it's a silty loam. It's a complete opposite to your soil, Alan. It's, 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 yeah. um, and my pH is 7.8, which is horrible. Um, and, uh, um, and then I have a terrible manganese deficiency, a really big manganese deficiency, which manifests. It's weird. I, you probably know more about it than I do. But So field maple grows beautifully here. So I thought, <laughs> great, <laughs> OK, well, let's try some other aces. And then, no, they all show up. Um, the manganese deficiency, the leaves look like I've accidentally sprayed them with Roundup. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's, but yet you think, well, if Ace of Compestry will grow here, surely other Ace as well as well, but that's, it doesn't work like that. I uh, know, I think the, I think that Ace of Compestry has, has evolved to grow um, almost anywhere. We use it a lot here in hedges. Um, we, our pH is neutral, so I mean, we can go either way really with it. But that, I mean, that's, I just love that as a hedging plant, in actual fact. It's funny, yes, I agree completely. I, I've got it in a mixed hedge because I always go to, when I go to, to your garden, I'm always really jealous of the plants you can grow up there. But I think wherever you go, you always think, oh, I wish I could grow that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I miss blue hydrangeas down in Cornwall every time I go down there. But I remember when I used to live in the West Country, I'm sick and tired of blue hydrangeas. <laughs> 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 it's like the blue Himalayan poppy we, we yearn, yearn for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, further north, where, where it's nice and cool, they, they proliferate here. Oh, I mean, dri you know, drifts of primulas. I, I can grow drifts of primulas, but they only last a year. 
before they yeah. die because it's too dry, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got drifts of Primula bulliana here, which oh. works in my wet area. Yeah. And there's they now sell seeding everywhere. And that, that is, I mean, you know, if you ever fancied coming over here, if you came over here it's sort of uh, in May, uh, the Iris Siberica and Primula bulliana together is, is, is my favourite part of the garden. It really is. Yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, but yeah. but in the dry summer, when the water table does drop, they do start wilting. So yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. yeah self-seed drifts of Premier Bulliana. That is that's on the wish list one day. <laughs> Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, I'm happy to supply <laughs> seed to anyone because I've got loads of it. So yeah. <laughs> so what have you brought along for show and tell then, Tom? Um, well, I, I was thinking of Alan a little bit with some of my plants here. Um, so I've got a few, I think, dry loving plants that will probably do better in your garden than mine. But the fact that they survive in mine. Um, uh, I've got, I mean, the first one, I've got this um, Sarcopaterium spinosum. Do you know that plant? No, I don't know at all. It's um, you see it growing on the sort of in, in Spain um, on the mountainsides and it's quite prickly. Um, it's actually in the Rosaceae family, which I find hard to believe. But anyway, but it's got this sort of. Um, honeycomb skeletal nature in the winter um, and, it, and it can take extreme dry and with your drainage um, on your soil I, I mean I, this has gone through two winters now and it should not be hardy here but I, I, I've got a lot of grit in, in the soil around it and, and it's becoming a thug <laughs> you know so I've got it on a west wall, admittedly, but I think, anyway, it's Sarcopaterium spinosum. And if you go for walks in the Mediterranean space, you, you'll go, oh yeah, that. It, and it's anti-browsing, obviously, why it's got these spikes. Um, and it has an amazing autumn color. Um, and it has these sort of red fruits, I suppose. And it's a, it's a shrubby plant. And uh, it's one of those things I thought, oh, that'll never grow here. The first cold winter, I'm gonna lose it. But here we are in winter number two. <laughs> But number three and, and it hasn't even been touched by the frost yet so so that's that's quite a good one I do um I do I do recommend that and then the other one you I think you might have this have you got that euphorbia gray hedgehog no nope. oh <laughs> okay well this self seeds in my rock garden I've got a I've got a gravel garden where my old driveway was which is on a slope so I'm out of my wetland area and it's bone dry there and baking hot sun and this is called Euphorbia grey hedgehog and it self seeds like crazy and it's a real beauty. It's got this lovely glaucous foliage. Um, that looks and, like something that I could grow here in the desert. Uh, yeah, in your, where, where you've got, yes, in your desert garden, um, it will grow, it will grow brilliantly. And, and, and I'm so, I'll tell you who's got it, where I saw it first was, um, is it Botanica? Botanical yep. nursery, yeah. That's where I saw it outside his barn in some gravel, and uh, um, and I just made a note of it and got. And I grew it from seed, another seed, uh, and I forget where I got the seed from. Uh, but anyway, it comes true from seed. It's it's a lovely little plant. It makes a sort of cushion, like a sort of yeah. man. So does this sarcopaterium. They make a nice cushions, which I I quite like in, in like in your in your dry garden is you have lovely carpets, a sort of tapestry of different colours, and then you get these nice little, it's like sort of natural topiary, isn't it? You get yeah. these lovely little cushions going on through the scheme. Yeah. So, so that's that. And then my third dry plant is, I, have you got Pistacia? I think I have, yes. Yeah, Pistacia lentiscus, which is, you know, where they make the gum from, um, which I think is a plant of the future for the UK, because you can clip it and make domes and topiary and stuff. And, and uh, so pistacia, I think they get in the Bible, it's called the lentisk. Uh, when they, you know, when, when they wang on about the lentisk, I don't know, this is what they're talking about. <laughs> and, 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 that grows, and that grows everywhere in uh, Europe and, and, and it's got lovely berries. It's, it does color up a little bit in the autumn, but it is evergreen. So yeah. Lovely So leaves. those are my three dry plants. <laughs> <laughs> I love those leaves, though. They, they, I mean, actually, the tiny well, they're leaves a good on combo. the first plant. And then, yeah, yeah, all of that. They're a okay. great combination. Um, so for a small, medium and large dome-like uh, shrub in amongst, uh, I, you know, when you get your, your sort of like thyme carpets and like in your dry garden. Because you've got um, uh, aeonium growing everywhere, haven't you? 
Yeah, but not not left out. Oh, you bring that in because I'm always jealous. Yeah. I thought. No, the, uh, well, I used to do I used to do Aeonium's in the front courtyard, which is yeah. outside the window here, and yeah. then. Uh, after having bedded them out for 25 years, I got thoroughly sick and tired of it. Um, and so we redesigned that garden and we've made it more of an entrance courtyard with stone flag paths um, and gravel areas and ju just really with beds against the wall. So it's much more um, formal than it ever used to be. But no, aeoniums occasionally survive outside here. Um, I got the sort of knack of growing them in hedge bottoms because it's always dry underneath a hedge, you know, and they, they just survive there. Brilliant idea. Brilliant yeah. idea. Also, echeverias do too occasionally. Yeah. But because but you you also can grow successfully uh, echiums, can't you? Yes. Oh, yeah, they're weak. I have trouble. <laughs> well, see, we we just had we've just been round and uh, doing our annual cull of echiums, if you like, because you could, first year or two you get these lovely rosette, as you know, Tom. Yeah. Um, and then the, when it's ready, it sends up the huge flower spikes. And you can tell when they're too close to a path, it's just going to get worse. So we get rid of those yeah. <laughs> and kind of sort of have to organise it. It's It breaks your heart sometimes, I have to say, because the ones that you want to get rid of and you know have got to go are probably the best looking plants in the whole garden. But yeah. you know, that's it. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. I, it's just one of the plants I, I've tried a few times now. And I, I think it's if I can get it established, I think it'll be up and away. But it's just getting it to go through... Um, winter here i find I'm, I'm having um trouble doing it but i'm i'm, I'm going to persevere because i've got um what's the one from the canary islands madeira madeira but obviously i, I put that in the in the glass house uh, for winter um i mean that blue is out of this world it's probably one of the best yes. blues ever yeah. really it's just beautiful so uh, well, there's something yeah. psychological about a blue flower because blue flowers always sell I mean, the bluer the, the the bluer they are, the more money you get for them. <laughs> really, that's a good tip. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the great thing with your echium, if you can just get it to flower and set seed, then they'll just tuck themselves into their little happy places, and then hopefully you'll get some established ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just, I mean, I think it's because you know, I'll 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 oik one out of someone's garden that says I can have one. It'll sit in the car for a week when I come back from holiday. And then I'll shove it in the ground. If I actually paid it a bit more respect, it'd probably be <laughs> fine. But uh, you know, <laughs> they do always. They're just one of those plants that I've I've only ever had sort of one in a pot. I've never had you know the success of getting them growing in the garden. But they always seem to be happy when they sell seed themselves somewhere. You know, yeah. they're just, they really they always grow, they always they always make better plants when they sell. So yeah, and I think the other thing is if you're starting off with them, start off with. You know, if you if you go past a gate and somebody's selling plants and there's some echiums there, pick the smallest one because the largest ones don't transplant terribly well. They need to be very small. So if I'm digging up seedlings to sell in pots, we dig up tiny things. Um, I always put them into long toms because they have a, a long root system. Um, yeah. And I always tell people, get them in the ground as soon as possible. Same with eucalyptus, because if you don't, they don't become root firm. Root firm, firm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I probably do go, I probably, when they say you can dig one out of the garden, I go, right, I'm going to have the biggest one then. Yeah. Go for the smallest. Or just get, I should get some seed and just put it in. So, yeah, those are my sort of rock garden favourites uh, to show you. <laughs> They're lovely. No, I like those. Yeah. And then, then I've got a... I've got a bit of another tree I can't grow, but I've got some, and I daren't plant them out because I know they'll die here. <laughs> is I'm a bit of an arbutus fiend as well. Um, have you got arbutus? Uh, yeah, we husband? have. Yeah. 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 Have you got you got an unido? Arbutus unido, we have here. Yeah. Have you got andrac? I see. I've got. Um, uh, this is andracne. Yep. So you see that growing in Turkey. And um, so it's got very, very much redder stems than, um, but then, but what, what I think might work in this country, in my part of the world, uh, is I've got this uh, ex andracnoides, the cross between Unido and Andracne. Yeah. And I well, think, got that. and that's a bit more vigorous, obviously. You can see it's much bigger. You've got that. Yeah. So, and you're on neutral soil, aren't you? We're on neutral soil, um, low rainfall, as you know. Yeah. Um, it's a light, light sandy loam, but it's very good. I mean, it's it's got every nutrient. I mean, it's grade one agricultural sort of land around us. 
So, you know, we are in that, the, there's a um, strip of land and it's known as the Haysborough Strip or the Stellum Ridge, I think, oh, yeah. um, where, which has this wonderful, wonderful quality soil. Um, we have, the garden is part of that. Now this one, I've potted it on twice. And I was thinking next year, I might try this one outside um, in, in the ground um, because it is a bit, because it's a hybrid, it should be a bit more, a bit tougher, really. Yeah, I think you should. But I do, I do, I do love a strawberry tree. But I've got are this other one. Are these seed grown? Are these, are these all ones you've grown from seed? No, those ones, uh, where did I get that one from? Uh, have you been to Jardin Sec, Olivier Philippe in France? No. You must go there. Honestly, it's just amazing. That's where I got that from anyway. Um, but I got it in a little P9 and I've grown it on. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I've got that one. I asked because I got some seed in one of those lucky dip packs from Chilton's. I always think with things fleshy, with a lot of flesh around them, they've normally got some sort of dormancy and they need to go the through a digestive tract of an animal to, <laughs> to get them <laughs> to, to, to open, really, don't they? <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that is true. They, I mean, that clears away the germination inhibitors. Yeah, but I think you know. So, so does so does um, um, a, a drop of fairly warmish water and a, you know a pair of rubber gloves and just squishing it about and washing it and, and washing. It's a waxy layer, isn't it? Quite yeah, hard. yeah. It and then dry. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. No, I haven't tried that, but um, I, I was going to put that in my gravel garden actually because I think with pistacia, with with pistacia in the wild in Turkey, you'll see those two, because it's a naturally occurring hybrid, the, yes. well, as you know, sorry, yeah, and, and, um, and I think they look really good together, so yeah, that's, the, and I've got Luma apiculatis, it's still called Luma? I think it's now Luma, it used to be Myrtle, didn't it? Myrtle. Yeah, yeah, and that's got that lovely coppery orangey bark, and I think yes, it'll be quite colourful uh, in, in the rock garden, so um because the, the the gravel I've used and and the stone, do you know uh, you know um, at Sandringham all the houses are made out of that iron stone, car stone. Car yeah. stone, yeah. 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 Well, that's what I've used here. I mean, it's not really local, but it's about as local as I can get. It's an hour and a half because otherwise it'd have to be flint, and that wouldn't look, that would look daft in my in my um, where I've got it. I mean, flint. I think flint gardens are nice with a grey because you've got this lovely backdrop. But, but with my brick of my house, it's quite a yeah. warm brick, and that's why I've used it for there. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, and because it, it's acid as well, you see, and I thought it would help bring down the, the pH a bit. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, that, that, those are my dry, that's my dry section. <laughs> <laughs> I love the organization of your show and tell. Yeah, so I did show, I mean, obviously got the little, I just thought that was a little reminder of Chelsea, my little Impatiens tinctoria, but I think I've seen Impatiens. That's not tinctoria, that's Soldenii. Oh, sorry, this is, you're right, this is Soldenii. Yeah. And I think you corrected me at Chelsea on that as well. Did I? <laughs> yeah, I've always most unlikely, no, most unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Soldenii, which I, I put in, it's in the greenhouse now, because I don't, I mean, I don't think this will go through the winter, will it? No, it wouldn't. No, no, not at no. all. But I mean, the one the one good thing about Sardinia for people who have got small gardens or small greenhouses, you can take cuttings of that as late as October, which I've just done this year. And, and we grow them in a cell tray and they remain in that cell tray until the end of February, beginning of March. We then pot them and they just grow like a rocket. And you put them outside, it, you know, after all danger of frost has gone and they make the most superb plants. And what, what size cell? Sort of like a like a plug sort of thing yes yes you grow them on as plugs i yeah. did them in 12 cells trays wow okay i'm gonna i'm gonna try that because it's a it's a great plant we've got we've got that one that you're holding there and we've got one with a which is white with a carmine black blob in the middle an uneven Ooh. sort of mark in the middle of the flower which is quite nice as well and there is a plain white version as, yes as well. there is a plain white one um i'll yeah. tell you where it, who's got quite a few different impatiens is a nursery called Desert to Jungle down in uh, Somerset, uh, which is sort of near Taunton. And he's obviously got everything from desert to jungle, um, <laughs> but he has quite a few, quite a few impatiens, which is always, uh, uh, we, uh, you can't beat an impatiens anyway for repeat flowering. And then I've got, I'm a fern fan. Uh -huh. I love fern. 
Um, so, I mean, that's, um, so I grow, because I, uh, my soil is too alkaline, I grow my Osmunda regardless in, um, in a tub <laughs> <laughs> where I've got a leaky gutter. So every time it rains, it drops into the, <laughs> into the tub uh, and it, it's getting too big now. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, I'm going to have to move it. But what I've, what I underplant it with is, is Selaginella um, krausiana, this little club moss. Yeah. Oh, that's um, lovely. Yeah. <sighs> Brilliant. And, uh, so I've got a fern tub, uh, and in fact, that fern tub is whenever I see um, an interesting fern, like a, a like a particular polypodium in the West Country or something or whatever, everything gets tried out in the tub before it gets released into the wild to see <laughs> to see how it does first. So um, so uh, yeah, so I've got I've got um, a lovely little polypodium I found. It's quite different to the normal polypodium vulgari. It, it's um, and, and I know you do get these little weird, uh, weird and wacky. It's is it bipinnate as opposed to pinnate? I think is yes. what I call it. Yeah. So um, I've got more more ferns here um, because I'm on. As I say, I'm on wetland, uh, but that that does dry out in height of summer. So I mean, polystichums do really really well uh, for me. I particularly like Herrenhausen because I I, I like it sort of angular habit and it's quite sort of filigree leaf and then the other one that does really well for me is it, but obviously this is all you can see at this time is matusia yeah i've got that to colonize in my woodland now and and you think my my woodland the the, the plant of choice in my woodland is nettle because it, which is you know typical of the habitat here but i've got this to i've, I've it's a bit of a battle against the nettles but i've got matusia to colonize along my stream and it's racing down my stream now. So I'm so pleased. That's uh, the one thing about Matusia is that it must have moisture. Yeah. yeah I could so, not grow that at all. No, and, and this is this is my this is probably my biggest success story. Yeah. I've, I've also got um deer and rabbit. I don't have rabbits so much now, um, but I've got deer, muntjac. And I mean, obviously, ferns they tend to leave alone, but they will have a nibble at them. But um polystich and matusia. Um, or uh, this is ordinary polypodium. That's the ordinary yeah. one. And then um, Ethereum uh, Felix Femina is, is uh, yeah, that's the one. So, and then there's a dry, is it Dryopteris affinis, I think, which is native, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So those are my ferns. So even though I'm dry, I, those ferns do quite well. Now, and I do like ferns. I've got a sort of mini stumpery, you know, I've got a lot of ferns around now. And 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 then I plant things like, um, Diasporum or something in amongst those ferns, uh, because then the deer, it's they're less likely to find the diasporum to eat it. So, so that, that's that's my theory anyway. That's a theory, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderfully naturalistic sounding planting scheme, Tom. It, it is. I mean, in the sort of most hostile part of my, you know, the, the sort of wet. It, it really is. If you blink, it's nettles, and then sambucus will come next and uh, um, brambles and things, and then the crack willow and alder will grow up through. And so what I was trying to do was plant plants that are, are as competitive as a nettle. And Iris Siberica is another one that, because the great thing about Iris Siberica, and I like, is Caesar's brother is my favorite, um, is that this time of year, the leaves all fall down and make a huge, great mulch mat right around the plant for the whole winter. So I don't cut back now until, um, you know, end of February. It's much easier then. It is much easier, but I want to keep down because otherwise those nettles, they'll, they'll, they'll push yes. on through otherwise. So, um, and then I've even got things like inula and, uh, uh, and things like that, that, that will out try and keep the nettles from recolonizing back into to my land. And that the deer will not eat uh, primula, um, they won't eat primula bulliana and they won't eat the iris siberica either. So that's my colour, those two things. And then the most of it's just ferns and um, I've got, I let juncus, I, I planted some juncus in there because it's quite a nice habit. And uh, and then I've got a uh, sort of shrubs, but it, it's, it's a bit of a battle really with this manganese deficiency because in the spring everything looks wonderful, it's going great guns. And then suddenly by July, everything starts to look a bit tired, all the shrubs do because of the manganese. But I mean, I've tried Vitax Q4, I've tried putting um, Epsom salts on it, but it's so short term. So, yeah, short -term. that's, that's yeah. the problem. Got to do it. Yeah. 
continuously almost. Mm. Yeah. What do you think is a top tip though? The, if you've got a really pernicious weed to, to find a way of out competing it. I mean, I have no great experience at this because I'm obviously a, a relatively new gardener, but with my parents' garden, we had so much ground elder and I just kept trying things, whether they were different comfries, you know, lots of lovely different varieties of that. You'd have comfrey corner. You know, I had loads of different types of um, lamiums, loads of different dead nettles just to sort of try and out compete and a good excuse to buy lots of different varieties as well. Yeah, no, because I've got, um, I did exactly that. I've got an area of ground elder in, 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 on a bank uh, by, by my pond. And that's exactly what I used eventually to push it out. It still gets in here and there. Um, but, but you're right. Uh, it, 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 if you can find the right plant that will just out compete what you're trying to do. I mean, nettles will, they'll still get in there, but, uh, uh, but not uh, uh, touch wood. It was, we're in about year seven now. And it seems to be working. I, I have to go through it once or twice a year. So that's yeah. about it. But, but the great thing about my soil, very easy to weed because it's peaty, silty. You know, you can practically pull a nettle yeah. roots and all out. It's really easy. So, <laughs> <laughs> Were there any more plants you wanted to show off? Oh, I've got loads here. Hey. <laughs> oh, here's another dry plant. Sorry. This is um, Lavangela um, dentata because it's obviously got the dentate leaf. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and here it is, still flowering. Amazing. Wow, beautiful. And really good, really good smell. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, that's from cuttings. Um, I don't know, I mean, have you got the beetle where you are, Alan? No, we haven't. No, no we haven't. There's, a, there's also a rather nice um, cream variegated form of lavender dentata, which I've got. And it's, 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 it's a bit like your... Um, Sarcopaterium, to remind myself, it's come through two winters here. Well, I mean, this 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 to me is is, is a real winner um, for uh, longevity. And I mean, I have seen the odd beetle around, so I'll see what happens. But um, yeah, um, things. So yeah, no, I mean, I've, I I can keep going here with yes. plants. So I'm a big. I, I really like um, the species like fuchsias as well. I really like yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, so I've got hats bashii, hats back, yep. back, which is just still flowering here. There's obviously lady bacon and hawk's head, the normal one, but I love those little. Um, really faint, yeah, I mean they're uh, Ma Ma Magellanica. Uh, oh, Magellanica is very good, and then you've got the golden form and the variegated form yeah, of that, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is absolutely lovely. Tell really you an interesting story. When Christopher Lloyd came to visit the garden many years ago. Yeah. Um, we had this Magellanica versicolor fuchsia bush and it had got some green, um, you know, it reverted, it got some plain yeah. green in, in amongst it. Yeah. So he said, well, you need to pull them out. So I said, well, I'll do it later because I, we can't do it now. I'll do it. And he just tromped <laughs> off through his club and tugged and tugged and tugged. Could he pull the damn thing off? No! <laughs> 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 but that's the problem with the one problem with that is it does revert rather badly. But another fuchsia that I've got is called Lottie Hobby. Do you know that? Song? Yes, I've got a little Lottie Hobby in my yeah. cold frame at the moment. Yeah, we've got it outside and it flowered the whole way through last mm. winter um, mm. in shelter kitchen courtyard, of course. But I mean, now I've got three forms of that pale pink form and a bright red form, which is uh, which is absolutely charming. I've got the bright red one against a wall outside and it's probably three and a half feet, four feet tall. Really? Yeah. Because mm. mine's just in a, a nine centimetre, so it's from a cutting and I was just waiting to, till it got big enough before I put it outside. But uh, I mean... We, we can grow it here outside um, with impunity. I mean, it really is. A bit, and, and the bright red one I've got in a border. Well, in actual fact, I don't know whether it's still there now, but when we had our snowdrop day, which was in early February... People were just taking other people to show them this thing. I remember. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's in flower in February. <laughs> yeah. Fuchsias, I'm glad they're gaining popularity again because, I mean, we, I put them in all my schemes. We did um, Newmarket um, Tattersalls, you know, the auction yeah. uh, horse place. We did the big clock tower uh, border and the big long border where they sell their horses there. And I remember presenting the planting plan and, and saying fuchsias. <laughs> and they were like, what? You can't have fuchsias in here. Anyway, they love them because, you know, it's such an important late flower, you know, in the flowering. Because their sales are at funny times of year. So we had to exactly, get stuff yeah. that was flowering. And I think I put them with Dahlia David Howard uh, as well, which they also are a bit horrified by as well. But, uh, uh, but 
It's a really, really valuable plant, fuchsia. Mm. Really valuable plant. The only problem with it is we now have the fuchsia gall mite to contend with. Yep. Uh, lots <laughs> of the species are, 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 are not so prone to it as the highly bred big doubles and things, which I don't particularly like anyway. No. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is there, so beware. <laughs> um, I've got, I um, think, uh, the var deformis. That's lovely. Which flowers every day of the year. Yeah. Every single day. Does the flower colour change? Yes, it does. You're absolutely right. Yeah, actually, yeah. 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 Um, so, I mean, I know people think periwinkle, oh, you know, whatever, but in, in places, this is a very valuable plant. And, and uh, I mean, this is right down my woods. And uh, yeah. uh, every single day of the year, this is in flower. So it's it's pretty amazing plant that is. Um, I like a posinaceae, the family, um, you know, the sort of propeller-like flowers of exactly, a, yeah. posinaceae. One of the most incredible sights that we've had in this garden is that growing through a holly, and it's gone underneath the bush and up through the bush, and it flowers at about a height of six feet, and suddenly you see, the, depending on time of year, either I see some creamy white flower or blue flower. You know, six feet tall. It's amazing. That is amazing. That that I mean that yeah because um because I think it's I saw it at your garden. You made me try uh, Tropelium speciosum. Um, I think it's speciosum or tuberosum. Can't remember. Um, uh, which you've got growing growing up a hedge. That's ciliatum. Is it ciliatum? Yeah, the one with the um, parchment coloured flowers. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very yeah. vigorous. Mm. Yeah, well, I've 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 tried tuberosum here. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I, I'm too alkaline, I think, and also I don't think my climate is quite right. But uh, uh, um, but anyway, I put it in, and it, it came up this year and went yeah. up the wall, and like it's, I've got it going up a bit of into some hedge, which is what I wanted it to do. But whether I'll have it next year, I don't know. <laughs> well, tuberosum should make big tubers underneath the ground, and providing we don't have too much frost, they should be okay. I've mulched it. I've mulched it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but they, you need to get the clone, which is called Ken Aslett. Yeah, Ken Aslett. I think you told me that once before, actually. Yeah, that flowers probably end of July, beginning of August, as opposed to waiting until October. Yeah, Ken Aslett. Must remember yeah. that. Write that. Down. I've got another and an, an, an thunder. I mean, thought is thunder will know this that <laughs> we have a, a a mutual liking for um, a tropiolum called Smithii. Smithii. Yeah, Smithy. Oh, is that the one with a little round, little little round sort of like got a little hole in the flower? Um, it's kind of like almost got um, like someone's had pinking shears onto the petal. It's got like little sort of jaggedy. Yeah, oh, I know the one you mean. I know the one you mean. Yeah, yeah. And that appeared yeah. in the garden here in a flower pot, which I which came with a plant that I bought. I don't know where the seed came from. It's, it's an annual, that. isn't it? No, it's not. It's it's a perennial, um, but it doesn't like the frost, and it will die in the frost. But it makes. Lots of seeds, and if you take seed, I gave Thunder some seed, and she grew it from the seed. I take cuttings of it because it's easier for me to remember to do that. Yeah, um, and it will grow eight nine feet in a season. I mean, it, it really is quite a vigorous one. That's that okay. That's the one I'm going to try then. That's worth trying. Yeah, uh, probably Chilton Seeds will sell that, won't they? You think, or... I don't know. I don't it know. It's hard they do, to but... get hold of, but it is one is of it? my favourite plants of all time. Yeah. I say it's hard to get hold of. Um, I should double check that, but I think it's not yeah. as easy to get hold of as some. I'll try that. I'll try that. <laughs> um, I'm I'm nearing the end. Uh... <laughs> Ow! Um, <laughs> Being attacked I've... by the plants. <laughs> uh, obviously, um, I mean. Um, Rosa moisei geranium is, yeah. I mean, you know, hips and haws. I've got a uh, Rubus coburnianus, obviously, uh, and then nicely said, uh, Viburnum, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Viburnum opulus. I mean, Viburnum opulus naturally grows here, and I really like it as well. Um, but what I did do when I first came here many years ago, and I've got an interesting name dropping story behind this as well. So this is my Salix. I've got, and I, I pollarded them sort of Somerset level style. So I've got, um, so I've got these flames all through my garden at this time of year that look really, really good in different colors. But I was at, um, my fr friend of chap was in my year at Kew. He got the job of head gardener for Stella McCartney. And, um, he asked me to go up to the wall garden because he was wanting to plant fruit on the walls and wanted some advice. 
And uh, when I was up there, Stella McCartney was having her natural sewage treatment plant uh, po uh, coppiced the willows. And uh, so, uh, and, and they were cutting down all these really nice colored willows. And I said to Keith, the head gardener, I said, can I, can I put some in the boot of my car, please? I bought them back. So these are clones of Stella McCartney's sewage treatment Salix plant. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, they're quite good, um, as I say, in my wetland, you see, because they make these great flames. And I've got this sort of pale green one. I, I assume they're all Alba origins, I, I, Salix Alba, or I, I don't know. Um, and then I've got this quite yellowy one, and then this uh, quite red, quite a ready red one um and so that they they, they uh they, they, that to me they're very valuable at this time of year in my landscape for sort of focal points throughout the garden ever do any weaving yeah well what i do we we use it as an edging i cleave hazel uh, posts and then and i use it as a sort of low edging which only lasts for a year or two if you're lucky but it's great because it holds all or any vegetation in place and uh you know, so it's, I do use it quite a bit. And then when I use my bean poles uh, in the vegetable garden, I, I tie together my bean poles with it as well. So I do use it. It does. It, nothing gets wasted. <laughs> what a lovely selection. I think I'm so glad that we do this podcast year round because it just shows there's so much interest to be had and also shows the different seasons. So thank you yeah. for a, a lovely wintry selection of things from your dog walk. Yeah, well, I, as I said, I did try and I did think of Alan when I was picking some of them. I thought this, this might interest him. <laughs> well, he was writing them down. That's always the aim. If you can get Alan writing down plants and adding them to his wish list. Well, I have, I have, I have written quite a lot down, I'll tell you. And um, uh, also, you just reminded me, Tom, I mean, th that how neglected it is to pollard a willow because it's akin to having almost like a modern sculpture in your garden. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and then, you know, if you hack it back annually, they do across the marshes here to, um, between us and Great Yarmouth, they do it. Um, uh, they're there to stabilise the banks, obviously, the, along the roadsides. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's nothing better than a coloured stemmed willow pollarded. And in the wintertime, it, providing you position it so that it can be lit by the low winter sunlight, yeah. So you've got to work out where it, where, where your views are and where you'll see it from and or most often see it from. I think it's a neglected thing because, you know, it, you said you went to Stella McCartney's and half inch some. Well, although you did say please. But I mean, they are so easy to grow and you can actually there are nurseries that sell bundles of willow twigs in with certain them. colours. Yeah, yeah. that you, you can get to, to do this with. So I think. It's, it's just a lovely thing to do. You don't want masses of them unless you're Tom Hoblin, of course, then you do. Um, but, well, you know, if you've got wetland and you've got the right um, aspect, it's fabulous. They're like sort of balls of fire on sticks. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, it, it, it does. That's the trouble. You've, you've said exactly the right thing. I do get carried away when something works. I do overdo it. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and luckily, honey fungus, Mother Nature kicks in and corrects the balance in the way that uh, <laughs> it's like I, I grow um I've got all my rambling roses I've got going up trees because I thought well I'm not gonna I haven't got the time to train them against the wall so I just put everything up trees and I must have 12 rambling roses yeah. um uh, you know for rambling rector obviously um Kiff's Gate, Q Rambler all of those Bobby Jane's Wedding Day and, and it looks silly because I've got too many. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but at least I can put my hand on my heart, my clients, and I can go to my clients and we'll go, Madame Alfred Carrier is the one you want in here. I can show you one. So uh, yeah. you know, it is, but it does. It, it, sometimes in the winter, I, when the leaves are all off the trees, I look at all my trees and they go, oh my gosh, I've got far too many ramblers here. <laughs> I think self restraint <laughs> is overrated. <laughs> I mean, as I say, I do show people my garden, uh, uh, like hardy plants and side of things. And I say, it's not, you know, I know I'm a garden designer, I'm not a garden designer, but I've got an example of everything here that will possibly grow here. 
and 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 I can it's like a sort of more like a laboratory in a way really that's what it is <laughs> well it sounds wonderful to me it sounds dreamy um before we wind things up after your wonderful show and tell we should dip into some FOMO and share that flower <laughs> or plant that we've got a, a bit of FOMO about something that's on the wish list um I got inspired by a walk to Anglesey around Anglesey Abbey we'd walked by Anglesey Abbey this was just before the leaves kind of went off all the trees we spied through walking the dogs we couldn't go in we looked through and it just looked amazing so we went back a few days later and the cotinus just everywhere you walked these wonderful mature cotinus in every sort of fabulous autumn shade and I have a small garden I can't accommodate many and I've already got two so I probably can't really explore my my desire <laughs> to grow more cotinus but I I don't know if you have any suggestions the two of you because if you start looking into it there are so many some of them a lot smaller some of them more sprawling. Um, I haven't got Grace, so I suppose maybe Grace should be top of the list. But if you have about Ob Obovatus. Oh, I might add that one to the list. That's quite a good autumn colour, that one. But I think it does get to a tree size. That's the only snag. That's the one I was going to recommend because it, um, <laughs> I, can remember it, I can remember it growing in a garden where I frequently passed. Green leaves, grayish yeah. green leaves. Yeah, yeah. These wonderful puffs of pink smoke. Yeah. Pinky smoke. And then the autumn colour was just fantastic. Every yeah. year it would go yellow and orange and then that bright, bright red. And then finally, you know, the frost one night would actually hit it hard and it all drop. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, uh, I agree. You know, we, we don't use that plant enough, you know. No, we don't. You're right. Uh, yeah. It's a, I, I suppose it's got a bit of a 1970s thing about it, hasn't it? <laughs> Yes. I quite like the 70s. Be... <laughs> but, but no, Tom... I, I love the 70s. Best music. Tom, I read in the newspaper <laughs> the Volenvants are coming back into fashion. Oh, really? <laughs> so that's 1970s, isn't it? One of our <laughs> most fashionable supermarkets, they're sold out and they don't know when they're getting any more. <laughs> but you know, now we've got um, fuchsias and dahlias firmly back in people's um, yeah. plant palettes of choice. Maybe we should be thinking more about get more cotines. I must put that, it's a really valuable plant to use. Yeah, thank it's you. Quite good. <laughs> I'll add a little bit to that because it's quite good. I mean, if after it's been in the ground two or three years and you find that it's getting too big, you cut it hard back. Yeah. Boy, does it put on some wands of big, big growth. So it's quite good in sort of tropical to give that kind of, you know, um, um, overly lush settings. Yeah. It's very good for that. That's what you that's what you could do is you could actually just coppice it to keep it yeah. small in your garden because yeah. at Hadlow in the Hadlow I, I went to Hadlow before I went to Kew and in the gardens there that's what they did is they coppiced their cotinus and had banana and um other and they used to coppice their catalpa as well so yeah you know, it's very big big leafed sort of border and everything yeah um so yeah yes good idea I like that I'll tell you what the next planting scheme I do is going to have cotinus in it <laughs> I'll keep my eye out. Uh, I, I'm really glad I brought Katinas up because that's just yeah. the kind of help I needed. Uh, Tom, where are you at with your Flomo? Um, well, I mean, I've mentioned so many already today, but uh, <laughs> the plant I, I can't seem to get to grow well here is uh, um, dry, Dryopteris wallichianum, the, the, you know, the, the Wallix um, fern. I just can't seem to get it to, to, it just, whatever I do to the soil, I put sulfur pellets in to try and change the soil and, and never, I just can't get it to grow here. And uh, even in pots, it never, it always looks a bit stunted and it doesn't have its full sort of shuttlecock kind of uh, effect. And, and, and I, I just love it so much because it's got that wonderful dark rachis coming up and it's such a beautiful fun, and, and, uh, uh, but I can't grow it. So upsetting. I'm going to have to move house, I think. <laughs> well, what about your crinkle crankle wall? I know. I know. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, it, it's a, it shouldn't be, you know, because I can grow other dryopteris here. So why can't I grow that one? It, 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 it just doesn't go through the winter with me. It does not go through the winter. It's odd how some plants don't. Uh, I mean, if I were you, I would bite the bullet and buy three or five and try them in different parts of the garden because I think possibly that one of them might survive because I think yeah. the lots of the problem is the, the microclimate in various areas of the garden isn't it? Yeah it, it could be that because down because I'm sort of underwater in the winter that I know that kills it uh, as it would kill anything <laughs> but um, 
but then yeah as soon as they get up into the dry so you're right yeah i probably should because um you can i know where you can buy that in nine centimeter and, and plant that because it would just because it's a for a for a fern it's quite a structural it's like an exclamation mark in a yeah. fernery so that's yeah. why it's so important so yeah that's my um plant that i um, wish i could grow here a so, ferny yeah. flomo uh yeah. alan where are you at this week well, I'm another Ferny Flomo, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's another Wallichianum, I'm afraid. Is it really? Yeah. Um, it's a plant that was recommended in uh, one of our very glossy gardening um, magazines called Gardens Illustrated by Jimmy Blake. Oh, yeah. He grows it in Northern Ireland and he says that it makes a superb plant. It's exceedingly slow and it's a terrace, P T E R I S. And I've looked it up on the internet and somebody like Pan Global sells it, but I'll probably have to take a mortgage out to buy it from him. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I spent a fortune there to, yeah. feed deer, to feed my deer here, I do. <laughs> yeah, you, you and me grow. Um, but, but he grows it and there are pictures of it in the internet, on the internet with these long stems and then the croziers unfurling and becoming six feet tall. And I just thought, wow, that could be, um, you know, that's that could be a conversation piece, shall we say? Yeah, so, I'm going to have a look at that one as well. Yeah, do, do, I mean, it doesn't sound very hardy. Well, I don't know. Um, he, Jimmy, says it grows well in his woodland garden, um, and it came through the winter of 2010, which is minus 10 degrees. All oh, right. So uh, I don't know. Um, Let's both try it and report back. Yeah, yeah, we should. <laughs> And the other, the other flomo that I have, I'm being greedy this week. I'm going to have two, <laughs> and that's well. You know, you get to this time of the year, and everything starts to go down. I mean, your dahlias are blackened and all that kind of thing, and then we start thinking about winter flowering plants. And I have quite a few Daphne Baluas around the garden, which yeah, I got one, absolutely yeah. adore. Yeah. Um, you know, three months of this wonderful scent wafting at you. Um, and there's one that I would like to grow, and it's called Garden House Ghost. It's a white flowered variety, um, and I haven't been able to get it anywhere. But it's it it is a stunning plant. Is that from the Garden House in Devon, Monocorum? Yeah, but Monocorum. Yeah. Do you know Keith? What's his name? Um, Wiley. Yeah. I'll tell you a little story with Keith Wiley. He did a <laughs> he did a talk at the Suffolk um, Showground. Um, for the Suffolk Gardens Trust and um, the event that they had there. And, and um, I can't remember the name, Mr. Cood Adams or whatever. Giles, is it Cood Adams? Yes, Giles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He said, and now we have Mr. Willie. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was at that. Because like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you and I did a talk there as well. We've done one yeah, there we did. before. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I'm going to grow that terrace. And I'm yeah. going to try, take your advice and try the dryopteris in a few different places. I think you should, because I, I mean, I've often found that, you know, like yourself, probably, when you're interested in lots and lots of plants, you soon learn to become a half decent propagator, because if you don't, you, you know, you go bankrupt. Because yeah. uh, yeah. yeah. there's money to spend on plants. Um, but, you know, once you get to that, get enough of them you I, I think that's what I do here a nurseryman came to the garden and he, he'd got a different version of um Impatiens tinctoria to the, to the usual one that we grow um I don't know whether it's going to be any different or not but I'm ashamed to say that he brought me this he, th he brought me three plants and uh anyway he he went off to look at uh, the trials that we we're doing here for the RHS and whilst he was gone, I took 10 cuttings and put them on the mist bench in, in the <laughs> greenhouse. And then I was taking him around the greenhouse later on. And he said, have you taken cuttings of those already? <laughs> <laughs> I had to admit, yes, I had. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly been a treat hearing all of your seed growing endeavours and the fun and games you have with plants, Tom. It's lovely to, to chat to a garden designer who just absolutely adores plants. Well, yeah, it's been fun talking to you. That's, I, mean, I got some top tips as well. <laughs> I've got some top plants. I mean, Barcopaterium, which I'm going to investigate, and Euphorbia grey. Hedgehog, hedgehog, yeah. yeah. If, if you, if you, that's I've got spare sarcopaterium. If you can't find it, I mean, okay, I, 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 I've got. I, I bet it takes some cuttings really easy as well. Uh, well, it should do. It's rosacea, it's fairly easy. I was discussing with a friend the other day about taking rose cuttings because I kept saying he's a wholesale nurseryman. I said, why don't you do it from cuttings? 
oh, well, I can't be faffed with all that. And then That's he really suddenly, easy. yeah. So he suddenly decided to try it and he was amazed at how well they grew. Um, and, and you don't get all that awful suckering business either. Yeah, I mean, Rosa Chinensis. I mean, that was my first yeah. thing I ever, I ever propagated from, uh, my first cutting I ever did was with yeah. Rosa Chinensis. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, if anybody is sitting here and you're overwhelmed by all the wonderful plants you want to grow, do remember full plant list in the show notes, whether you're listening to the audio version or watching the video version. And we will make sure we put one onto our social media and our website, getgardeningnow.co.uk as well. There's a full plant list page so you can go just immerse yourself in hundreds of wonderful plants from all the past 70 odd episodes. But uh, Tom, thank you for being a wonderful guest for all your well, fabulous wintry show and tell. And hopefully you'll come back one day. I'd love to. I really enjoy nothing better than talking about plants for an hour. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got three happy faces. Yeah, yeah, three happy faces. And maybe next time we can talk a little bit about Chelsea. Okay, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Between now and then, happy gardening, everybody. Happy gardening. <laughs> Max, who's your dog? It's Trevor. It's because we just had a delivery, so yeah. Hopefully it's, uh, it's my wine your wine <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in fact you know we were going to talk about a plant i couldn't be without are we allowed to talk about that yet uh, well we, we'll do a sort of later but you can oh, okay. allude to it you okay, can right, tease okay. ahead tom <laughs> okay sorry <laughs> which is brilliant got, i'm really sorry i've got to go and sign for a delivery <laughs> <laughs> your excuse it's your wine I don't know. Yeah, I'm so Go sorry. Sign. I just said leave it there, and he said, and he's holding up a thing for me to sign. <laughs> sorry, Alan. Hey.